morning, everyone. Welcome to church. You can stand and sing with us. Is I off? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. You can stand and sing with us this morning. I'm on now. Good to see you, everybody. I've got a few announcements. Um, you can join us after the service today uh, for coffee downstairs. Good time of fellowship. Um, and if you've got, if you get the bulletin, you'll see in there. There's a counseling session coming up. The Institute uh, for Biblical Counseling is running a workshop to help individuals process personal struggles and provide basic training for care of others. That's gonna be at Rock Nest coming up uh, April 24th, 28th. And if you need more information, you can look in the bulletin or talk to uh, Dan <coughs> Linnell. You've got one. Good morning, church family. Uh, our women have been so blessed to be doing these Bible studies by the Daily Grace Co. And we've been doing mostly topical studies over the last while. Um, but this coming Tuesday, we're starting a new study called Grace in the Wilderness. And it's a study on the book of First Peter. And I believe it's gardening season, so my head's a little into that right now. But I'm pretty sure we have two books left. So if you are interested in joining us, it's Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. And we would love to have you join us. Thanks, Lino. And men's breakfast is still happening. It's uh, Saturday mornings, 7.30 till 9 at the church. And we're just starting on uh, Titus this week. 
Uh, so if you're interested in coming, um, please show up on Saturday. And there's going to be uh, no prayer meeting this Wednesday. So it's going to miss one Wednesday. Uh, the organizers are going to be away, and uh, so we'll have it the week after. And Pastor Jared's going to be away this week. He's going down to the uh, fellowship conference. I guess it's on the island this year. Any other announcements? No? Okay. Scripture reading today is Psalm 150. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his sur surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we praise your name. We praise your name because you are God. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. We praise your name because you created each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you came to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you um, paid that price so that we are no longer slaves to our sin and that we can follow the path that you have given each of us. So we praise your name, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would help us to show your love to those around us, that they would see something different in us, and that they would seek you and find you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Jared. We thank you for his strong teaching on your word. We ask that you would give him the words that you want us to hear today. And we ask that you would bless the offering that is collected today, that it would be useful in your kingdom. Thank you for these things, Lord. Pray, ask that you would bless this time. Amen.
to understand what God has will what God has planned I only know at his right hand stands one who is my savior I take him at his word indeed Christ died to save me, this I read. And in my heart I find a need of Him to be my Savior. That He would leave His place on high.
bishops could pass up the offering.
<laughs> Children's Church, kids can come on up. Good morning. Is this on? Hello? Huh, okay. So uh, this was one of those weeks where lots of interesting things happened. I spent far too much time being frustrated and grieved over the state of things around me in the world. There was weeping over people I know who aren't saved, and people who claim salvation but live for the world. It was a week where school seemed overwhelming. I had heartbreaking conversations with non-believers in the community over some of their interactions and experiences with believers There was a party on my street on a weeknight that involved a bunch of shirtless people, lots of alcohol and other things, and in the morning we found a sock and underwear on our deck. The week started last Sunday afternoon with a birthday drive to Smithers where one of the kids got sick all over the vehicle twice before we could make it home, which began a wave of the flu sweeping through our house for the first half of the week. And so as things kept coming up, there was plenty of opportunity for me to get frustrated, feel overwhelmed, and just generally want to give up or quit things. And perhaps you're feeling that way these days too. You're tired in many different senses of the word. You have moments where you just want to quit and be done with everything. It seems as time goes on, I'm having more and more conversations like this, and I'm reading and hearing more of these kinds of statements from people. You know, there's all sorts of reasons. The political climate, the constant and unending promulgation of all sorts of narratives, climate change and alarmism, job loss and the mill closure, the pressures and the demands of life, trying to be a good mother or father, trying to be a good husband or wife, trying to navigate the teen years or be a kid in this chaotic world. There's social media and news and influencers and celebrities just constantly shoving their opinions down your throat everywhere you look, everywhere you listen. There's subjective reality and no absolute truth, so anything can go, well, sort of, but anyone can choose what's true for them as long as it fits within certain narratives. There's racism and hate, 
And beyond that, maybe you saw some of the Easter services that took place in the States this year. Or you're seeing the things that are happening throughout churches in North America. You're hearing the false doctrines and even heresies that are being taught by many popular preachers. Or you're seeing people that you care about being deceived by false teachers. You're looking at the testimonies of the lives of many professing believers. Or there's illness, loss of loved ones, and mental health struggles, and the onslaught of mental health problems in our society today. Your blood pressure's probably rising just from this list of examples. And yet there's so many more things that us in this room are struggling with, right? I mean, real struggles. I don't want to make light of that. Some of you barely made it here this morning. You're doing everything you can just to hold it together enough to get through the service. There's some in this room right now that you don't know how you're going to make it to tomorrow. But you don't want anyone to know that. I don't know how many of us are putting on a front this morning, acting like everything's okay, saying that everything's fine when it's not. But I know there's probably quite a few. And the incredible thing is that when we're struggling, our brains have a way of convincing us that we're completely alone. No one else could understand what we're going through. We're unique and peculiar, and we're all on our own. Besides, if they knew, they'd only judge and abandon us. So we remain isolated. We stay quiet. We put on the makeup, use eye drops, work up a smile, and get ready to answer, how are you doing, over and over again with good and fine. But you know, times are too hard for us to be doing this. The struggles are too real and the pains are too great. The times are too wicked, the culture too hostile, the society too chaotic for us to be living in self-preserved isolation and facades of happiness. And maybe some of you here this morning have no idea what I'm talking about. You're doing well. Life is going well. You've got your struggles, but overall you feel happy and fulfilled. Well, praise God for that. I'm glad that you're not in this boat, but I think there's many more in this position than you may realize. And for those who are struggling this morning, you're not alone no matter how well you may convince yourself. So I have to wonder, what are we doing here today? We're supposed to be gathering together as a local body to worship God, to hear His Word proclaimed. We're supposed to be gathering together to bear one another's burdens, support each other, serve one another, and challenge and encourage each other. Is that what we're doing here? Some of you in here right now are feeling so beat up from this world, you don't have the strength to praise. You don't have the energy to listen to another sermon, shake more hands, and say the word good ten more times than you already have this morning. And some of you have such little desire to deal with anyone or speak with anybody or risk having any real or deep interaction this morning That as soon as the service ends, or even the last song finishes, you'll be heading out the door. Glad you came, but glad to be going. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the things that truly matter. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. 
We're going to open God's word and we're going to be gathered here together this morning as a group of people that's learning to love and support one another as we stand in awe of our glorious Savior. So please turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 1. We're going to read verses 2 to 4. James 1, 2 to 4. And if you're able, I ask that you would stand with me as we reverence the public reading of God's word. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, you know the pains of our hearts. You know the weights and the burdens that we're carrying, the frustrations and the difficulties you know how close we've come to giving up and how many times we have given up. And Lord, we know that you care. That you're not indifferent, that you're not like a carved image of stone or wood that sits dead, but that you are the living God. So this morning, Lord, let us praise you. Look into your word to hear your instructions for us. And Lord, may your spirit work mightily in each one of our lives so that we may know you more and love you more and live the lives that you've called us to live in freedom and victory and power and peace and joy, these things that for many here seem so unattainable. Lord, you are good Thank you for this time together. Open our minds, open our hearts. Teach us, we pray. Amen. Before you sit down, there's a, a practice that we've done multiple times now as a church. One that I think is important for us to do together every now and then. Something that fits with some of the difficulties and the pains that I've mentioned. For anyone who hasn't been here for this before, I'm talking about a leap for joy. Now, this is a physical exercise that represents a spiritual truth. It's an outward action that helps facilitate and promote a heart response. So no matter how difficult things are, how sad you may feel or crushed and defeated you may be, when I count to three... We're all going to jump in the air together, put one or two hands in the air, and yell, praise God. Not because we do or don't feel like it, but because God is worthy of our praise. And we need to preach to our own souls to rejoice and to praise the Lord in all things. So if you're physically able, if not, just put your hand up, yell, praise God, that's okay. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Can do so much better than that. I am sure of it. Let's try that one more time. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, you may be seated. So the passage that we just read in James talks about enduring all sorts of difficulties. And not just enduring them, but considering it a joy to endure. Now if you're going through some stuff right now, I'm sure the last thing that you feel like 
doing is being joyful about it. I mean, that's, that's countercultural. That's contrary to our very nature. Everything about it feels unnatural and wrong, even offensive. But this is often the way of Christ. You may have heard it uh, called the upside-down kingdom. You know, the first shall be last, the weak shall be strong. The idea that in God's economy, much is opposite to how we think. But James isn't saying something here just to be contrary. He's actually giving the reason, the motivation to do something that's against our nature. We are to consider the trials a joy because they test our faith. And the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. Your translation might say endurance or perseverance. So we aren't joyful about the trial or the difficulty itself, but because it has the potential to make us grow. We see something similar from Paul in Romans 5, 2 to 5. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, we have the freedom to respond however we want to the circumstances in life. We don't have freedom from the consequence of our choices, but we have freedom to choose how we will respond. And James and Paul are giving Christians some practical instruction here. When difficulty comes, you can choose to change your perspective. You can and should choose to see the trial as an opportunity to grow. Anyone else feel upset about that right now? Sometimes that's really frustrating. It's easy to to read these words and to to attack James, to attack Paul. You don't know my position. You don't know the things I'm going through. You don't know the trials. It's so easy for, you know, words on paper. We have to remember who these men were, the lives that they lived, and how they could say these words. It's an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to to test your faith, to produce endurance, to grow your character, to increase your hope, and to rest in the love of God and the power of the Spirit. Of course, we could choose instead to grumble and complain about our circumstances. I don't know how many of you, like me, seem to turn this way first. So often, we could choose to wallow in our victimhood. That's an essential way of life in our culture right now. But what good would that do us? We wouldn't be growing in steadfastness or character or increasing our hope. So that's something to think about. You know, I think it's pretty great that we have these practical kinds of instructions in Scripture. Things like the Proverbs that give practical wisdom for life. They're necessary. And again, in a world of relativism where there's no truth, everything is up to you, and and self-help, self-gratification, and psychological self-focus, it's important for us to hear some pointed pieces of truth that wake us up make us uncomfortable, offend our sensibilities, and make us question our views and our practices. 
James and Paul are men that readily answer the call to speak the difficult but necessary truths. And so here we have this formula of sorts. We will face trials. That's unavoidable. We then have to choose whether or not we embrace them with joy. We have to choose whether we allow our suffering to harm us, break us, and nothing more. Or if we'll use our difficulties to produce godly character and to grow us in endurance. Now, it can seem so simple to lay it out like this. I mean, I think the majority of us wouldn't want to suffer for no reason, right? If we're going to endure something hard, we at least want it to count for something. So let's make it count. That's why I got us to leap for joy this morning. Because we need to take our thoughts captive and retrain our brains and learn how to grow. So how can our endurance in today's trials grow our faith and make us steadfast? Let's briefly look at a few things from a couple different passages. Things that I think will help us choose to joyfully embrace our opportunities for growth. God is our comforter. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4a, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. In our trials, we have to remember that comfort can be found. We don't just have this cold, indifferent instruction to choose to find joy and endurance. God is with us. He lavishes or pours out His mercy and grace. He brings comfort When we suffer, Psalm 147 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We can find joy in the trials because we're not alone. We don't have to be. We won't remain broken. We don't have to. The great physician will bring healing. So as we choose to joyfully embrace difficulty, and as we seek to grow, we remember to call out to God to help us and to heal our brokenness. And in all of that, we remember that we don't go through these trials alone. Or we don't have to. God is with us and His Spirit dwells inside of us as believers. He won't leave us or forsake us. His comfort isn't temporary or conditional. For this, we can certainly rejoice. Secondly, the gospel brings strength. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. I said this verse at home yesterday, and John said, hey, that's my verse. (laughs) When we realize what Christ has done for us, how He purchased us with a great cost, And because of His love and His grace, then we have to start thinking differently about the situations in our lives. And we just went through the Easter season where we talked about the triumphal entry, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And we rejoice over these things. But do we allow them to challenge our thoughts and perspectives in daily life? 
or do we limit the work of Christ to a moment of salvation and nothing more? First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because of Christ. A hope that can carry us through even the darkest and most difficult times that we face. Because it's not anchored in our circumstances, feelings, or possessions. But in the person and work of Christ. It's perfect hope. It's how Cory ten Boom and her sister could praise God and thank him for the fleas in a concentration camp. It's not about us, it's about him. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Doesn't that sound nice? Peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Our Lord is a conquering Savior. He's the risen King. When we face trials, we don't have to let them overwhelm us and consume us. Jesus said that we can be encouraged because he has authority over all things. We can trust and rejoice in him. Which leads to the next consideration. We have eternal hope. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We do not lose heart. We don't become discouraged and downtrodden. Even if we're wasting away, even if our mind is deteriorating or plagued, Because God is building us up. He's growing us. And as we turn to Him and seek Him, we can find renewal in Him each day. We can even view all of the sufferings and the trials of life as light and momentary. Boy, that's another offensive thing to read sometimes. You don't feel like you can go on. You don't feel like you've got another day in you. And you read Paul calling it light and momentary. It's because we don't live for this world. Our hope isn't here. Our fulfillment isn't in the things of this world. Our end goal isn't health, wealth, and prosperity. We live for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We live and we hope for something so great that nothing else of value could ever compare and no amount of suffering could ever detract from it or flip the scales on a cost-benefit analysis. How can we keep this mindset? And Paul tells us in this passage, we look towards the unseen things instead of what is seen. I mean, that sounds super easy. 
We focus on the spiritual instead of the physical. Things like our health, our jobs, our homes, everything. They're transient. They're temporary, fleeting. They don't last forever. The Bible says that this life is a vapor. You ever breathe outside when it's cold? And you see something for a moment and it's gone? That's our entire life on this earth. A vapor. But the unseen things, the spiritual things, are eternal. They last forever. What we did with Christ, what we did with the gospel, what we did with one another, And we keep our eyes on heaven. We focus on the glory that awaits us. We've talked so many times in men's breakfast about Paul and his attitude and the things that he writes, and so many of them seem impossible, but for Paul, it was always a focus on eternity. There was always the focus on heaven. It was always running for the prize. It was always laboring for the souls Philippians 3, 13 and 14 say, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's what's the goal or the prize? that your eyes are fixed on? Health, wealth, prosperity, the American dream? Or is it Christ? Is it running the race well and hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant? Last consideration. Let's comfort and encourage one another. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, there's something more for us there. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Another reason that we suffer is so that we can be equipped to help others in their suffering. This is another reason to joyfully enter our trials as we seek to grow. It's also a reminder and a challenge for us. We must comfort others just as God comforts us. And this is one of the many reasons that the church exists, to comfort and support one another. So today, if you're struggling, don't hide behind good and fine. Share your burdens with someone else. Don't leave as soon as you can. Stay and visit and let others into your life and allow yourself to be part of their lives too. Know and be known. We need each other. Like I said, the times are too wicked and there's far too much happening around us for anyone to try and go through this life in isolation. So let's support one another, pray for one another, love each other like a unified body of Christ. Dear people, we have a ministry. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. 
This world is desperate for the gospel of Christ. They just don't realize it. We have work to do and our time is limited. We can't allow ourselves to be defeated. We can't give up. We can't give in. It's not just us who suffers when we quit. It's our families, those watching us, our church community, and all the unreached people who need to hear the gospel. We're so busy being broken that we're not going out into the brokenness of the world. We can't give up. The stakes are too high. Souls are too precious. And our Savior's return is imminent. Second Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 4.1 says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Galatians 6, 9, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And surely, the Lamb who was slain is worthy to receive the reward of His suffering. Jesus is worthy of our pursuit to lead many to Him. Houston Baptist Church, I know we have our hearts and our pains. I know there's deep struggles. <coughs> Can we surrender even these things to God and trust Him to do what's right? Let's count it all joy for the sake of our endurance and the opportunity to grow. Let's use our trials to spur us on to great works that glorify our Lord. Let's use our sufferings as opportunities to support and comfort one another. And above all, let us remember our incredible God, His great love for us, His power working in us, and that He awaits us in glory. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your great love. Thank you that you don't abandon us to figure this life out on our own, but you give us instructions. You gave us your word to speak to us this living word, sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, this morning, let your word impact our hearts. Teach us to surrender to you, to do things that you instruct, even when it seems backwards or upside down, where there's many prolific, prominent leaders who tell us otherwise. God, when psychology and your word don't match, let us choose your word. Lord, this morning, heal. Heal our broken bones. Bind our wounded hearts. Fill us with your hope and with a burning desire to know and to love you more, with a burning desire, a call to anguish over the lost and the dying around us that don't know you. Time is short. This life is a vapor. Lord, give us a burden for others 
to support and to encourage each other, to spread the hope of the gospel, to show each other your love, your mercy, your grace, the comfort that you comfort us with, empower us to comfort one another. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the blessing of this morning. We praise you. We love you. We pray all this in the precious name by the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite the music team to come up here. I don't know what you're wrestling with, today, but uh, if you need to spend some time in prayer, if you want somebody to come and pray with you during this last song and even after that, after the service ends, come up here to the front, Just sit in the front pew, kneel on the ground, lay on the ground, just seek God in prayer. He will hear, he will answer. He will comfort the brokenhearted. Will you seek him?
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go in peace, join us downstairs for fellowship, and come and pray.